On this episode of Security Weekly, we interview Micah Zenko, a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and author of the new book, Red Team, How to Succeed by Thinking Like the Enemy. In the stories of this week, since it's episode 443, we'll probably talk about SSL, or TLS, as Larry likes to correct me. Um, and we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. Embedded hacking is in the news again this week in a big, big way, uh, and lots of other stuff. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, systems aren't the only things getting penetrated, functions are the only things getting wrapped, and bits aren't the only thing getting banged. And these cocktails, they are super flow and steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all of your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash Tenable Jobs. Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pwn Pad, the Pwn Phone, and the Pwn Pro. For enterprises, there's Pwn Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. Welcome, everyone. Hey. To Security Weekly. Because here's your host. Uh-huh. Yeah, your host. Why? Because he's a man who can dream about you if he can't hold you tonight. Paul Asadoria. <laughs> Dude, I get these <laughs> random songs in my head. Like, just random. Now, sometimes they are purely random. Uh, like, that are. one was just purely random. random. Yep. And the, sometimes, if I go next door to get coffee... Yeah. Um, which we drank all of their coffee. They have to order more. It's pretty funny. Um, it, the manager next door was like, you guys drank all our coffee. I'm like, well, <coughs> it's important to stay caffeinated. Yes. But so I'll go over there, and they'll have the music on in yeah. the cigar lounge, but it's kind of like in the background. Yeah. So like I'm listening to it, but I'm not really listening to it. And then I'll get back over here, and I'll start drinking my coffee. And like that, whatever. I'm like, where is that song? I'm like, oh, Earworm. that was the song that was on next door. <laughs> Earworm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, a classic earworm. <laughs> Mr. Larry Pesce is, of course, here in the studio. Yes. It's nice to have you, Larry. That's it's, been yeah. it's been a little yeah. while. It's been a little while. We've been had some we teaching. Had th th you were at we had Thanksgiving um, off. Ha Thanksgiving off, but then Hackfest. Hack Fest. Yeah, epic, 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 epic Hackfest trip. Was it good? You it, said you were doing a couple was. talks, teaching class. Yep. Uh, I started, uh, started off doing two talks there when we showed up the day before. It turned into three talks. Yeah, <laughs> um, and then the In Guardians did guys did a fourth talk, um, <laughs> which we basically stayed up all night writing. Oh wow! Uh, so it wasn't even like I'm oh, just no. going to take whatever PowerPoints are on my laptop and no, those are, yeah, no, you guys wrote was, a talk at the conference. That's yes. pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. Well, it was the the five minute in booth demo on the little TV type of thing yeah. that they turned into a half an hour talk. Nice. And yeah, it was uh, it was epic. Oh, good. Uh, the the super secret event was loads of fun. And then six days of teaching on top of it. You were probably tired when you uh, just a little, yeah, just a little, yeah. And where where was that? That was in Virginia, right? That was in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Yeah, yeah. So anything fun in Alexandria, Virginia? Um, yeah, Some I mean, historical it's, it's, historical it's significance. Right across, it's yeah. right across the river from DC, so you can. It's you a, basically it's a really go short to yeah, DC. So it's essentially and, uh, DC. Yeah, you know, really historic town, and and all sorts of. Right in the area was all sorts of. Uh, restaurants. There's like 73 restaurants right in within like a 10 block radius. Oh, good. So, yeah, it was it was fun. It was fun. I'm gonna have to go to that next year. Are they yep. gonna be in the same venue next year? Do you know? I don't. Mm, I don't know. Okay. I honestly don't know. 
but yeah, I'll be back at CDI. Um, in oh, two so weeks you go here. back to DC area? Yeah, I'll be at uh, I'll be at CDI in two weeks. Nice. Yep, not teaching this time. I'm actually taking. Oh, a that's class. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, Mr. Joff oh. Fire is with us on the lines via Skype. Welcome, Joff. Yes, I'm here. G'day, Paul. How are you? You were supposed to be in studio, dude. What happened? I, I know. I, I just like uh, default responded. I'm in studio. Why not? You know, uh, subconsciously you wanted to, and you were close. You were you were in the New England area. Yes, I was in the Northeast, but uh, no, I ended up flying home today. So not in studio, but uh, but you're here, and that's there. the important part. We got you on Skype, which is good. Uh, I do, I do have one very quick announcement. Uh, the discount code Black Friday is still valid. It gives you 50% off all of the items in our store. Woo. Now pay attention very closely to this, right? Our store, as it stands today, will only be online until the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Then it's going away. And next year, it will come back in a different form. Bigger, so, better, and uncut. Yeah, um, the the plan, well, Aaron really has this vision that I think I'm buying into where he says, dude, no more of the hack naked shirts that you've been doing. You get a new design for next year. So I've been telling you for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I'm finally coming around to this idea. You need so to there's do- the, the hack naked design we have now. Yep. So we're going to sell that in the store until the end of the year. Next year, we're still going to bring that old design to conferences and yep, stuff. Until they're we gone. Still have some stock until, until they're, they're gone. gone. But the online site is going to be what we think is going to be a new design. And... Nice. Um, I still haven't – no one's made the decision as to whether or not what we're, who's going to do the new design. The guys that really want us to put it out to the listeners. I think that's fantastic. Okay, so maybe we'll do that. I think I, you're, I you're, think you're, 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 you too, Joff. You think we should put it out to the yeah, listeners? Yeah, I think we should put it out to the listeners. I think it would be a lot of fun. Yeah, you know? no, I, no, I don't know what we're going to give the person that wins the, the new design. Yeah, yeah, we'll I, give them something. Yeah, I, More I, than a T-shirt. I'm like, more, we dude, t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> more than a T-shirt. I'm going to give them something more than a T-shirt, dude. You're, like, yep. you're spending time designing a shirt for us. Yeah, my, my, my thought would be, you think, yeah, and uh, no, we're just talking out we're loud just, here. Yeah, we're just, we're just shooting Nothing set in stone. My thought would be, you know, what would you pay an hourly rate for a graphic designer to come up with something for the shirt? And then... You come up with something reasonable as, right. a, as Some like kind a of prize. prize. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, you know, I think uh, the, the uh, information security community is an incredibly creative group of people. I think we'd end up with some awesome designs come in. Yeah, we're a little washed out too, Nick, on the camera. Yeah, we want to adjust the, the white balance too. Sorry, we're we have one person behind the scenes today, so it's kind of interesting. Nick's going to be stressed. Yep, he <laughs> I is. apologize. So. Um, so, yeah, so make sure shop.securityweekly.com, that's really only <laughs> going to be there till the end of the year. We've got maybe five or six sweatshirts left from the 10-year. Wow. Um, we've got uh, tons of T-shirts left. Uh, some of the sizes might be running a little low. Yep. So um, after the first of the year, shop.securityweekly.com is going to basically have a message to say, yeah, we got stuff in stock. If you really want something, you can email us, but we're not making any promises. Yep. And then uh, I think we're going to use Teespring. Oh. So, so basically custom you on, upload on your design yeah. and they ship them and send them to yep. you. Kind of like Cafe Press type deal, but much better quality. <clears throat> yes. It's what Twit is, I think, using for their They're T-shirts. Nice. So nice. Uh, we're going to do that next year. And, of course, have special stuff to bring to conferences still, but the Absolutely. online stuff is going to go there. So I just wanted to give our listeners a heads up. I mean, right now is your... Your best chance. I mean, basically, fifty percent off is the conference rate. I mean, we sell T-shirts for ten bucks at conferences. We have since two thousand and six. Yep. I think it was two thousand six. Well, the first, the first time we offered T-shirts. Two thousand six Schmoocon, they were ten bucks, yeah, the and che- still today they're ten yep, bucks. One of the cheapest T-shirts at a con you can buy. Yeah, um, I was gonna say that is a great deal. Yeah, too. and so now online you can basically get that same deal. Um, so go do that. And I'll leave that discount code there to the end of the year. So yep. make and, sure you go there and, and get your hack naked gear. Yep. And that said, you know, we, what do we make for money on a T-shirt? It's very, very little. It's not much. I, yeah. I mean, because to print them, it's maybe. Yeah. To print them, like your printing cost is essentially $5. But then there's shipping and then yep. storage and exactly paying people to process orders. and Exactly. Shopify exactly. costs money. So Exactly. So yeah. I mean, like there's very, very the little profit. The margin is really, yeah. It's because it, the first run of shirts I think we gave out for free. We did. We they just said hack naked on the back. Exactly. It was yep. before the mud flap girl. Yep. We did have a run before mud flap girl. Yeah. It was that the one with the eye, the shifty eyes. Yeah. Shifty yes, eyes and it said hack eyes. naked on the yep. back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, okay, so I want to introduce our very special guest for this evening. 
Uh, Mika, God, it's about time. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Micah, Micah Zinko is a senior <laughs> fellow in the Center for Preventative Action at the Council for Foreign Relations. Ooh, sounds fancy. Yeah. He is also the author of Red Team, How to Succeed by Thinking Like the Enemy. Micah, welcome to the show. Very glad to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, I apologize for the, the delay tonight, um, but it's wonderful to, uh, to have you here. Um, so, Mike, uh, tell us about when I first was reading your bio, I was like, well, Council for Foreign Relations. Like, it sounds like you work for like an embassy and you do politics type stuff, but it's much more than that. So, uh, you know, for our listeners' benefit, uh, explain what the Council for Foreign Relations is and, and what you do there. Sure. Well, I'm a lapsed academic who now does uh, has the privilege of doing research and writing on a broad range of sort of national security uh, and uh, I would say uh, U.S. foreign policy issues. Uh, CFR is a think tank. Um, it's a considered like a polite uh, centrist member. Uh, it has members. You can uh, apply to become a member. Mm -hmm. CFR has been around for like 90 years. Um, it's famous for putting out this blue little blue magazine called Foreign Affairs which is sort of a uh, 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 establishment press thing where you debate U.S. foreign policy issues. We have offices in New York and D.C., and I'm based in New York where I've been here for about seven years. And mm -hmm. my beat is everything from the United Nations to I'm sort of known as the, quote, drones guy, uh, mostly looking at uh, drones used for lethal counterterrorism operations. Uh, but I also um, have spent the last five years interviewing over 200 people for this book, trying to understand uh, red teaming across the different fields. So you have a very much uh, security focus then? Yeah, very much national security. Uh, uh, I worked at the State Department for about two, two or three years on a, mm -hmm. on a very discreet project related to the war in Kosovo. But my background is I, I basically spend time with people who plan and conduct military operations. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, the people in the, in the planning community, in the weapon, weaponeering operations community, in the logistics community, um, and so that's where I give a lot of my talks to places like Carlisle, the U.S. Army War College, and Leavenworth and Maxwell, where the Air Force uh, Academy is and so forth. Uh, that's that's kind of who I talk to a lot. And I give a lot of talks in, in Washington where I learn uh, from people who practice for, you know, I always tell people I don't do anything. I just write and research for a living. So I talk to people who actually do things and then learn from them. Nice. Um, so it's a very timely news story that's happening in California, and I wanted to get your take on it. As I, I think you'd have an interesting uh, perspective on that, with your given your background. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a horrific uh, one of those worst case scenarios of potentially self activated uh, individuals who decide to get access to lethal technology and then unfurl it. So there might not be any signature or any predictive measures that you could have had to know that they were going to do it. Uh, they pick a soft target, so it has no um, mm. uh, security guards. There's no history of uh, security threats to that facility, apparently. And then they just unleash a tremendous amount of uh, death and destruction. It's the hardest so, thing. So, Micah, do you, do you think – so when I look at that as a security professional, you know, my thinking is – how do we monitor their communications and how do we gain intelligence into what they're doing? And it's kind of scary for me to think about, well, what if they didn't communicate at all? But I got to think that they did communicate in some capacity. And how do we gain insight into that? Well, one of the things you have to do is shrink the pool of likely individuals who will commit mass shootings. The problem are, is mm -hmm. the United States mass shootings are so routine and conducted by a pretty w wide array of individuals. Uh, mm -hmm. the demographic I was reading about that, yeah. yeah. The demographic profile is so significant, and there's roughly been one a day uh, conducted, over the, in, conducted in the last year. Now, what's fascinating to me is whether they characterize this as an act of terrorism or not, because mm -hmm. last year, uh, the United States, there were 24 U.S. citizens who died from terrorism. Almost all of them were in Afghanistan or Iraq or somewhere in Libya. Uh, you basically, if you kill somebody, even with an overt political motive in the United States, they don't call it terrorism. Uh, so certain acts of behavior get labeled certain things and more attention. But again, you have to shrink the pool significantly of who you care about most, and then dedicate resources to to uh, uh, to, to gather more information. People always say like, "Well, you have these suspected jihadists. Why don't you just put more resources towards them?" You have to have something like 20 individuals uh, to monitor a one or two potential individuals around the clock. That hmm. is to have constant, persistent surveillance upon them. You think about FBI and local law enforcement and how much they cost uh, and then how much they earn overtime. You can't do this with that many people. 
Mm -hmm. And then if people are using uh, or not communicating and have simply decided to look at things over the Internet or simply decided from reading the newspaper to uh, uh, self-activate a plot to kill individuals, it's very, very hard to predict or to stop. Do you think it's a a sleeper cell problem like we see in Hollywood and in TV, right? Well, it's it's interesting because sleeper cell uh, implies that there's some direct uh, both authorization and steering and motivation from a foreign source. Mm -hmm. And these individuals were then embedded within the United States. Uh, The fact of the matter is that most uncovered jihadist plots in the United States have no directed authority from anyone abroad. These are individuals, some of whom might travel uh, to to different areas Mm -hmm. and become either radicalized or inspired, and then they come back. But most of them, uh, there was a report, a great report, I invite you to read it, George Washington University put out this week. It looked at every uncovered ISIS-connected plot in the last, uh, uh, in the last uh, year or so, and it's 86 different individuals. 96% of them were men, but 71 of those 86 were U.S. citizens, mm-hmm. uh, and then the, most of the rest were people on permanent resident status. So this is not an issue of people without proper papers or people who are refugees. These are people who were born and raised in the United States. If we classify the types of things that happen in California as terrorism, what can we do better, especially from a digital perspective? You know, we're all uh, computer security nerds for the most part listening to the show. You know, what can we do better to gain intelligence, in, in, to gain enough of it to be able to help prevent these attacks? I mean, the, the most useful thing, which most people in the InfoSec world don't do because they're uh, focused primarily on p- attack surfaces, platforms, and how people communicate is you really have to learn their way of thinking and behaving. Mm. Uh, and so there's a lot of English language. You know, one is just called Dabiq, D-A-B-I-Q. It is an English language, very slick, uh, uh, basically monthly bulletin that ISIS puts out. Anyone can find it. You can read them all online. Uh, they give a really uh, interesting insight into how they speak. But you really have to sort of know where the message boards are, have some sense of the platforms and the communication uh, apps they use, and then from there, try to get some build pictures of your threat, build pictures of your adversary, and then you can do a better job of trying to understand it, and then when authorized by relevant law enforcement, uh, potentially penetrate to gather further, to exploit and gather further info. So do you think it's a resource problem? Do you think if we devoted more resources, and I think you're, you're closer to this problem than, than a lot of people, certainly myself, right? Uh, I feel like that the uh, organizations that are uh, charged with preventing domestic terror are way overtasked. Do you think it's a resource problem that if we would devote resources, give them the right tools and techniques and training that we could get ahead of the problem? Well, it's not necessarily resources, although resources help. I mean, it's interesting to go back to the 9-11 attackers. I mean, the 9-11 attackers uh, passed through uh, uh, transit and border points that were supposed to be screened and monitored something like 60 times. Mm. They operated freely in San Diego and Maryland and Oklahoma. Uh, people always talk about safe havens, like the safe haven was in Maryland. The safe mm-hmm. haven was in Boston. It was in Hamburg. It was in London. Uh, it is much more difficult for jihadists to behave in that way. Uh, right. Th- and so in some sense, it's, it's less about money than it is about uh, common sense security practices, training, uh, regulations and sticking to them, and then just doing covert testing to un- unfurl vulnerabilities. But the the group that I've spent the most time looking at, at and I've uh, m- I mentioned them in the book, is the NYPD, and mm-hmm. sp- specifically their counterterrorism bureau, which is essentially like a CIA combined with multiple SWAT teams, uh, combined with an, an impressive intel- intelligence analytical capability, and they do rigorous uh, uh, simulation training. They do tabletop exercises. Uh, so if you live in New York City, which is the as very clear the number one target for these groups, uh, you feel pretty safe and secure because they throw a lot of money and personnel at it. Interesting, interesting. Um, yep. So uh, uh, go ahead. The, 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 the NYPD guys that I've interacted with are absolutely fantastic. They are. I mean, they're on yeah. their game. Oh, I yeah. think. And, oh, yeah. You know, obviously, yeah. it, it's unfortunate that a tragedy such as 9/11, which hit more than New York City, but it right. really hit home in New York yep. City, of course. Um, had to fuel that, mm-hmm. but uh, like you said, the people we interact with from 
yep. NYPD. Exactly. Uh, they're just amazing. Uh, and one one thing I want to you know make make sure to clear a little bit up front is that um, you know we've gotten we've delved into some fairly you know politically charged type of stuff as of recently, and we usually don't talk politics. We usually don't. Yeah, this is and, kind of a different and, and, interview, Mike. This, this is and <laughs> yeah. this is very different, but it still all goes back to some of the same things that we think about in information security about absolutely threat, threat modeling. Yes. And, and risk and risk acceptance mm -hmm. and um, in detecting threats, that, right? Exactly. Like, exactly. Mike, I, I'm drawing a lot of uh, parallels between the way that we would detect and identify threats, um, you know, either potential or active threats in our mm -hmm. networks, in the same way that we would in the physical real world. Are there a lot of parallels there for you as oh, well? Yeah, absolutely. And and the ironic thing is is as you all know, people in the infosec community do not talk to people that often in Homeland Security mm -hmm. and people in the private sector probably don't spend enough time with their local law enforcement and FBI. Uh, they don't know the, you know, the DHS cert vulnerability uh, disclosure process. Like the people who should be learning from each other because there are commonalities and principles that they all worry about. And you get them, you know, I've just sort of learned in the process of the, writing this book is that you talk to people at the NYPD and they keep saying to me, well, tell me, tell me what does this other group do? What does the U how is the U.S. Army doing this? And then I talk to just various, you know, pen testing firms, and they, and I also talk to a lot of people who have just either in or just came out of the NSA, and they tell me what is the NSA doing? And then I talk to DHS, and they say what is the FBI doing? And <laughs> so mm. the, the the sharing of threat information, the sharing of best practices, the sharing of how to you know restructure your networks, how to how to test and practice command and control, how to figure out who makes the decision when is necessary. This really doesn't happen that often, uh, but the co there are common issues that, that exist all across these different fields. Mm, absolutely. Micah, tell me a little bit about your book. <clears throat> and I guess first, um, what's the purpose of your book? And then the following question of that is, what is red teaming? Because we great. have a lot of different definitions for red teaming, I mm -hmm. think. Well, it's funny because I, I describe red teaming as, as this 90-10 problem because... 90% of the population has no idea what it is, so I have to explain it to them by giving lots and lots lots of vignettes and stories, but the 10% who know have very almost closed-minded and proprietary ideas of red teaming. Uh, they, they do red teaming, and their red teaming is really the, the best red teaming uh, that's out there. Ironically, red teamers tend to be sort of closed-minded uh, when, they, when they think about what they do. Um, but, you know, I was just fascinated with this topic, and I, and again, I come to this primarily from the, how, the, how the U.S. military does it, how mm -hmm. the CIA does it, and, you know, I, I feature the CIA's red cell, which is a out of the box, uh, outside of the mainline authoritative analytical uh, units, and I and I just kept seeing red teaming popping up everywhere, and I and this is I've been gathering just information over the past ten years or so, and I was wondering why hasn't there been a book that looks at this across different right. fields? Oh, clearly, Mikey, you said too much. They're coming for you. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, Micah, uh, when you talk about uh, a CIA red team, for example, are they uh, or are they they could be both, right, or separate teams? Are they red teaming against the CIA in the U.S. to make sure that the, our own uh, intellectual property and in, in, uh, information is secure? Or are they red teaming against the enemy to see what information we can gain? Or probably both, right? So I break down red teaming into three types. Mm -hmm. So there's the one you all know, which is the classic sort of vulnerability probe pen testing. And then I look at red teaming simulations, which is, yep. I point out in the book, the NYPD tabletop exercises, very rigorous responses to before the Pope visits, before the marathon, before the first Super Bowl here, what, what would happen with all these scenarios. And then the final one is alternative analysis. Now, alternative analysis is everything from business wargaming to Team B exercises to really out-of-the-box future scenario planning. And the red cell was created two days after 9-11. Basically, George Tenet, who was the CIA director at the time, called mm -hmm. his head of the analytical side of the house of the CIA, and he said to her, I want you to create a group of people who know nothing about terrorism, and all they do is think about strange and weird scenarios that will piss us off and will make us think differently. And subsequently, and they didn't have to go through any of the other vetting process for their products. They didn't mm -hmm. have to coordinate their products, and they self-tasked, which is critical, so no one told them what they could work on. Um, and so the red cell has grown to this very day to roughly 20 people, and they do truly out of the box, strange scenario, team B, uh, alternative analytical techniques. Now, hmm. the people who try to break into the CIA, that's the NSA's uh, tailored access operations program. Um, mm -hmm. And they do this both, uh, they do this for the CIA, they do this for the military command, like Central Command in the Middle East and Pacific Command in Hawaii. 
Uh, and they do very rigorous and serious uh, uh, red team penetration tests, and what they find is often very disturbing. So it's interesting, though, you know, what you term as red teaming in the CIA to think about out-of-the-box thinking about what the attacks could be. We typically call that threat modeling, and we do that for a lot of corporations. And it's interesting because it takes a certain mindset. I mean, not just – it takes some creativity, right? But it, 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 I go back to Mike Porn's example of, like, your evil hat, right? Yeah. Like, you got to have your evil hat yeah. on. And you got to think, if I took what I knew – is that your evil hat? Or would I? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is my evil, my evil Christmas hat. Nice. Um, oh my God. If He's I took what I knew, and, <laughs> and I, and I took some creativity, and I thought evil, like what what mm-hmm. what would I do? What would I do? And I, I that's I think that's a really powerful exercise. Well, a lot of people can't do it. I mean, that's one yeah, of the things I, I really agree. learned at at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where they teach uh, army majors and lieutenant colonels how to become red teamers. One of the one of the longtime instructors there, I was meeting with him and he curled his tongue. He goes like that. He goes, can you curl your tongue? And I said, yeah, I can. He goes, see, some people can't. Some people huh. can't think in a malicious, devious way. Some right. people mm. cannot think about uh, bodies on the ground, people being killed. Uh, it's one thing to, you know, check the front door to try to break in. It's another to, you know, pose as the HVAC people break in and then to cause real uh, to, to just exploit the vulnerability to this greatest extent, which is what a really devious, creative red teamer does. Right. Um, and lots of people just don't have that personality profile. Well, and the, di- the difference is, right, there are people who can think that way that want to do good, and there are people who think that way that want to cause harm and do evil. And, and there's a very finite line between those two people, and we like to cultivate the people that, like a lot of us on the show and listening to the show, that can think evil and want to do good with it, but there are uh, obviously a lot of people out there that want to do harm. Well, a clear, I mean, one of the examples of this, and it's an out-of-the-box sort of unit, which is Navy SEALs. Like the U.S. Army Delta Force, which is their big counterterrorism team, they grow mm-hmm. them from the Army. So you go to the Army, you're infantry, you're ranger, mm-hmm. and then through selection process, you become a Delta Force member. But the Navy SEALs are very different. They don't cultivate from the fleet. They take about 90% of their people just guys off the street. Really? really? I didn't I didn't know that. I knew well cuz I read the book uh Inside Delta Force by was it Eric Haney? Yeah. Yeah, a great book which was the basis for the TV show and all that stuff. Um so I, it, that was awesome to gain insight into that that branch. But I didn't know that Navy SEALs will recruit from outside the Navy. Yeah, I mean and that and what they're looking for are just people who are weird and different, many mm. of whom uh if they weren't in the service might be criminals. Uh, uh, or, or might be engaged in sort of abnormal asocial behavior, uh, hmm. and that's part of what they look for, right? Hmm. So, so it's really it's really hard to find people who both are willing to uh, uh, you know maintain good order and discipline, but also be uh, creative and devious thinkers as well. Mm. It's hmm. interesting, that's, Micah. Yeah. Who were some of the more interesting people uh, that you interviewed for the book that you want to share with our our audience? You said you interviewed over a hundred people for your book. Over, over 200. 200. So who are some of the more interesting people? I mean, not to pick any favorites, right, but share some stories. Yeah. So, I mean, interestingly, one of the guys I really learned a lot from was General Peter Schumacher. Uh, General Schumacher was one of the founding members of Delta Force in 1981. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to uh, say that name rings a bell probably from reading the book that I read. Yeah. And he later became the chief of staff of the Army under Donald Rumsfeld in 2003. Mm-hmm. But what's fascinating was that he was a member of the famous uh, Delta raid in 19, April 1980 into Iran to try to free the hostages. That was the f- and that was a really that's a sore subject with Delta Force, right? That was it, one of their it, failed it their failed missions. Yeah, it is. And, and, and the, the, I mean, there was a lot of it's a really great example where they didn't think through all the they didn't do what, you know, in the army, they call a pre-mortem analysis, which mm-hmm. is every way that this plan could fail. And it's also one of the reasons uh, that the Army does red teaming. And, when, and the red teaming they do is very specifically uh, to do pressure test uh, murder boards of operational plans because they've learned that the guys who write the plans, they spend 16 hours a day in a room locked together. They're on, as they call it, mission lock. All they want to do is accomplish the job. And you need an independent outside set of expert eyes mm-hmm. because you, I mean, just to maintain unit cohesion and to achieve the mission, they don't, people won't be dissenting. Um, so anyways, I interviewed Schumacher. It was just fascinating because, I mean, the stories he told me about how poor the army, the, the state of the army was in the, in the 70s and 80s. And he was, he spent in the 1980s seven years in Beirut 
uh, undercover mm -hmm. missions that he, you know, can't quite get into, but a lot of hostage rescue and intelligence collection. So he's just a fascinating guy, and uh, and I go into detail with him. But the other guy I just I would mention is, um, and he's one of the heroes of the book, is a guy named Bogdan Zakovic. Bogdan uh, was the head of the FAA Red Team between 1995 and 2001. They did uh, the FAA Red Team was formed several years after the Lockerbie Scotland bombing because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they found out that the uh, commercial airline security was really terrible mm -hmm. and there wasn't people doing covert uh, testing of any of the processes or any of the technologies or the training. And he had a team of about five or six people and everywhere they went, they uncovered really horrific vulnerabilities. Uh, they did this at various airports. They did it with, you know, even when people were tipped off ahead of time, uh, technology didn't work. They got, they smuggled in explosives and bombs mm -hmm. all the time. They then reported this. They detailed what they did very carefully. They reported it to their bosses. Uh, and what their bosses did with it is quite a mystery because before 9-11, basically the FAA, all it could do was issue a letter of corrective measure to the airline, or they could impose a small fine which in, a, in an arbitration process would, would be reduced. Mm -hmm. and, the head, and the heads of the FAA all, not surprisingly, were former commercial airline executives, or one of them was the former uh, head of security at Logan International Airport, by the way. <laughs> um, so, so they found all these vulnerabilities. They told everybody, and nothing was done. Now, after and, and that's a frustration point that a lot of us in, in the hacking and security community share wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it, the story in the book is heartbreaking because... They, they, they literally told everybody, they went around the official channels, they told Congress, they told the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, they told the Inspector General. So after 9-11, Bogdan f files a uh, federal whistleblower case, which he eventually won. Mm. Uh, and, but, Wait, now what's a, what do you mean by a federal whistleblower case? It was basically that, that the government was, it was, it's a gross misuse of public funds that caused uh, severe harm to citizens. Hmm. That's that was the claim, and they found out that this was true. Uh, Bogdan lives to this day in Ohio. He still works for TSA, but he does not. He basically they don't take advantage of his expertise, as he as he described it to me. He's a desk clerk now because it was embarrassing. I mean, what he found was embarrassing, and after 9/11, they didn't want anybody to uh, to reveal all the vulnerabilities that he and his team had uncovered over and over and over again before 9/11. It's and it's a very sad story. Well, and a lot of us uncover those, I mean, being security right. professionals by accident, mm -hmm. oftentimes we go through TSA and we all have shared stories on the show oh, and God, on our yeah. blogs and in the community. Anytime you, uh, Mike, I don't know if you've attended the security conferences, right? But anytime you attend a security or hacking conference, right? One of the stories, uh, storylines that we all share is the in the security vulnerabilities that we found going through airport security. security. Yep. Yeah. Well, you probably know that uh, just uh, a couple months ago, the Department of Homeland Security Office of Inspector General, uh, uh, he testified in Congress and he revealed that they had done um, covert pen tests of six different airports, right? They did we 60, mm, they did 60 did. tests and they, and they successfully got um, banned explosives or, or knives or ammunition through 57 times. Yeah, we talked and, about and, that story <laughs> when it came out, Mike. Yeah, but it's the, interesting. The fascinating thing, which, which people don't know, is that uh, the guys who did this are literally taken from desk jobs at DHS IG headquarters. They're inspector general auditors. They are then told, try to smuggle this through this checkpoint, this TSA checkpoint. So they have no training in security. They don't oh, do God. any surveillance. Mm -hmm. They just try it. They just try to get their way through, and they succeeded almost every time. Mm. So there's some nervous desk monkey thinking they're going to get busted. Well, I mean, as a result of this, again, you don't do red teaming to embarrass or humiliate. It's to improve security, ultimately. And they've done about eight hours. They gave over 50,000 TSA agents eight hours of really intensive screening. They recalibrated some of the, uh, some of the screening technology, um, and they've done a little better job with leadership. That's also why the security lines, if you've gone through airports recently, have gotten longer in the last month or so. Uh, but they, they found the vulnerabilities, and again, that's – that's the whole point of my book and the whole point of red teaming is I always say you cannot grade your own homework. Maybe maybe yeah. that's why my yeah. that's maybe that's why my bag got tossed at the airport last time I went through the pre line and I thought she, the the X ray tech was just being lazy. Yeah, <laughs> I think she still was. But... <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to implement at scale, right? And when we talk right. about mm. airport security, 
we've all read the many of us have read the articles about how uh, Israel does security in their airports. We're like, well, why can't we apply this model to the U.S.? And I think it largely <laughs> is a size. matter of, of scale, yeah. right? How many, how many airports are there in Israel? Mm. Well, if you've ever flown to Israel, uh, you go through, and in, in from an airport in New York or New Jersey, for example, you go through U.S. screening, and then you go through LL screening at the at the at the uh, uh -huh. gate, um, and those are people who do nothing but that job. These are, uh, I mean, everyone through military service, they a lot of them come from police intelligence backgrounds. One of the one of the myths is that U.S. federal uh, TSA people can't do quote profiling. Actually, they can do profiling. But as one DHS official told me, we assume our people are too stupid and not trained to do it well. Mm -hmm. uh, Israelis do it as a matter of training and a matter of principle. So they're actually really, really good at it. Uh, um, and so, again, there hasn't been an LL airliner, uh, any noticeable threat to one, except for uh, not from the air. There have been uh, surface-to-air missile uh, attempts at one in Kenya uh, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but there hasn't been any any known uh, uh, breaches of LL security in a long do, time. I don't know if this is still the case, but I had a friend that used to fly a lot on LL. Um, do they still have armed uh, guards on all the airplanes? Well, I don't know if they announced that, but my my assumption is they do. So my my understanding was that he I seem to remember him mentioning was that it, whether or not it was announced it was obvious like there was a guy standing at the cockpit door with an AR, with an M sixteen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> type of thing yeah. so but so um, in, in terms of red teaming Michael what are some of the parallels between what we would term as a red team assessment in the digital world and a red team assessment uh, that takes on more of a physical uh, presence. Yeah, so, you know, I think a lot of people are starting to get the factor that the attack vectors and the attack surface to what you are trying to protect are more than your computer networks. And this is something that has taken a long time, uh, <clears throat> but I think people realize more and more that radio frequency, physical, uh, digital, everything is open for, uh, um, for is, is an open vulnerability, especially with increasingly internet connected things. In many ways, it's very similar uh, because the most crucial aspect of both the physical pen test and a digital pen test is the initial scoping engagement in the conversation, right? I mean, oftentimes it's a compliance conversation, either for he uh, for HIPAA or PCI or something, and so the person just says, "Well, we need to do a red team assessment," and it's like it, it's described to me by a lot of people who do physical pen testing. It's like a therapy discussion, though, ultimately, <laughs> because. <laughs> What they say is, tell me what you value most. And oftentimes, it's a senior VP or a CISO, and they'll say, well, we care most about profits. And they say, okay, do you care about profits more than, for example, reputation? So if I doxed all your customers' information, would you care about that more? And they say, no, 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 actually, I care about that more than profits. And they say, okay, now we're starting to prioritize things. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, most firms don't even know what they need to protect most. And unless you get that initial uh, engage, that initial conversation right, almost nothing else matters, right? Um, but this, and then and then after that, it's the same things both in both fields. For example, physical, they often try to scope the engagement as narrowly as possible. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. you can't you, you can't come in through third party vendors. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can't uh, try to you know uh, social engineer. Don't spear fish our people because we do spear phishing anyway all the time. Uh, you can try to come in through work hours, uh, <clears throat> through these approved sort of entry and exit points. Well. Of course, that's not how anybody devious will think. So they try to cook the test as well. But most are simply done for compliance. Most are simply check the box exercises, um, and that's and that's a frustration that a lot of people on in both fields feel, as you all know. Micah, of all the people you interviewed for your book, who, who in your opinion, has the um, the best red teaming program? So the best that I found is in the United Kingdom, actually. Uh, the the UK Ministry of Defense has a small unit in Swindon, which is about 70 miles uh, west of London. Um, they have a, uh, a, a teaching facility there where they teach military doctrine and they, and they do research projects. And they have this fascinating, they call themselves the Red Team. They consist of about 10 people. Um, it's led by a retired one-star general, uh, Tom Longland. And so they do a couple of critical things, which is there's no rank, uh, nobody wears a uniform, um, they self-task what they work on. Um, they're well-resourced. They, and most critically, they have the power to say no. Uh, so a lot of people come to them and they say, we want you to red team uh, uh, this strategic proposal we have. We rely on really to think through it. Or they'll say, we want you to red team how that we transport uh, soldiers from the, from the United Kingdom to Afghanistan or something. Mm -hmm. Are there vulnerabilities there? 
And they, in, in a series of conversations, if they feel that um, this is an inauthentic cook, uh, cooked test where they will not be given the access they need, uh, they won't be talking to the right senior leadership, and nobody will do anything with their finding, they'll simply say, we're not going to do it. Hmm. Um, a lot of people don't have that freedom of access. A lot of people are pen testing for the purposes of cashing a check. Um, and a lot of firms are doing uh, red team pen tests simply to check the box that they have. But people that have the authority and the sort of flexibility to uh, escape those problems tend to be the better red teams. Did you that's, visit that's this? Cool. It sounds very like almost like movie like, right? Like you fly to London and drive 70 miles and meet with these 10 like elite people. Uh, was it an in-person meeting or? Yeah, no, I, I went there. Uh, they're, they're not an elite people. I mean, it's it's funny. Like I've been to Langley and went to the CIA headquarters and I've met with the red team and mm -hmm. and the members there. Uh, these, I mean, red teamers, they, again, I, I always say it's not magic. There's no silver bullet. These are people. All of them are people. And the red team composition is critical. You want people with diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You want people who know how to play well with others. You want people, my, my term I use is fearless skeptics with finesse. Because, <laughs> That's really great. Wow. I like that a lot. Most, most, most red teamers are largely asocial, and they like to sort of embarrass and humiliate. They like to pretend that they're smarter than the group or the targeted institution they're dealing with. But again, if you embarrass and humiliate, the institution rolls over, dies, and it doesn't learn. Um, so, you know, it, it, people, there's a, there is a tremendous cachet that has been given to red teaming. And I think in many ways it's undeserved. Uh, uh, people think it is, you know, they like to say, like, we red teamed it, which means we've given it the best uh, assessment that we possibly can. But it's ultimately just um, uh, people taking an alternative perspective, taking an adversarial perspective, identifying blind spots, challenging assumptions. And there are some people who can do, who can do that and some people can't. But again, it's all just people. Mm. Joff, point. Larry, two more questions for Micah. No, I think I've sort of injected in line. Mm. Joff. Joff. Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't have any specific questions. Uh, it's, it's just fascinating to listen, to be honest. Uh, sounds like you have a, a really interesting job. And a, a really interesting book. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that. I, I didn't, I, I wrote the book because nobody had written it. And the more people I talked to, I kept saying, you know, I, 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 I interviewed these people at Sandia National Labs. There's a mm -hmm. unit there called IDART. Uh, uh, integrated Defense Adaptive Red Team. They've been around for about 15 years. Nobody knows about them. There's this group at Leavenworth. Um, it's a former converted military prison on the top of a hill in Fort Leavenworth where they, it's called Red Team University. They teach this to the Army, DHS, Border Guards. They teach it to the Marine Corps. But like nobody knows about them. The CIA Red Cell, similarly, it's an amazingly impressive group nobody knows about. Uh, NYPD tabletop exercises, all these, all these people that through a lot of persistence and a lot of uh, bothering and pestering, they were willing to talk to me because over time you demonstrate you know something about a subject and then people feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, although I will say something which is similar to one of your previous guests, Mudge, mm -hmm. said, which I found to be very true, which is fascinating, which is the private sector is far more secretive than the, C than the CIA or the military. Interesting. Uh, the private sector, because people, it's I proprietary information, people sign non-disclosure agreements, they were actually the least open to true introspection and willingness to, to, to conversation. So you have two mm. problems. One is a legal problem, and then a lot of the people who do this work are consultants, and consultants have no reason to tell you the truth. Um, they're trying to sell a product or a service, and so every story they have is of tremendous success, uh, achieving their objectives, improving profitability, improving security. Uh, and anytime there's a failure, it's always the fault of the business they're working for. It's not their fault. Um, so it's really hard to judge them a in a rigorous and honest way. That's great. The book is Red Team, How to Succeed by Thinking Like the Enemy. How, how, how is the book going? It's going pretty well. I mean, the, the, the most, uh, uh, it's gotten some good reviews at like Washington Post and Harvard mm. Business Review and places like that. But the coolest thing is that the people I talked to came back and were happy. Now, oh, every, everybody in every field, like the pen testers I talked to say, you didn't get it quite right, and the Marine Corps and Army people I talked to say, you didn't get it quite right. There's no, re there's no way I could get it all right. I mean, mm. I'm, I'm just an outsider learning everything I can. But to hear from them and to say, we appreciated that you did this, that meant a lot to me. Hmm. That's excellent. Uh, it's on my short list to read probably over Christmas break. So 
Uh, I encourage all of our, our listeners and viewers to do the same. Just need an audiobook version. And That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, our, our listeners are, are very much audiobook friendly, Micah. It's, it's 11 hours, and the guy who reads it is in this most soothing oh, uh, really? NPR like voice. It's fascinating. Oh, so there is an audiobook version? <laughs> yes. Audible.com. Sweet. <laughs> um, so, Micah, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Let's hear them. Three words to describe yourself. I would say skeptical Packers fan. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, if, uh, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Green Bay, so I have to say. There you go. I'm from New England. I've been in Rhode Island my whole life, so you know my sports affiliation. And you probably, I spent seven years in Boston. I hear you. I feel you. Yeah. You're, you're a sports fan, and you probably hates me, which is fine. It's cool. <laughs> um, if you were to write a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, still learning. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Hmm, that's a good one. I would, I would um, offshore the problem and hire outsiders. There you go. Hmm, excellent. Your man in India dot com. In the popular <laughs> game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I'm not even aware of the game. It's popular it's in Europe. Europe. Uh, well, if it's if I'm in Europe, I suppose as an American, I'm supposed to go first just to demonstrate initiative. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. Nice. <laughs> Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh, boy. Um, I would say the late painter Helene Frankenthaler and to pick a, I pick a, well, I can pick another woman, too. Uh, yeah. You can. Yes, absolutely. Welcome to the 21st century, my That's friend. Right. You can choose whoever <laughs> you like. Uh, no, I would say I have to pick somebody. Who... Oh, that's a good question. It's a I, tough you know, I, I, I would probably, well, I, I, I guess I can't take my own parents. Um, you could. Some people do. It's fine. They're, they're not celebrities. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, but they, they are, in fact, celebrities in your own mind. In your own mind. That's what some people go with. They, they, then I think I, I would take my parents, who I love very much and are wonderful to me. Excellent. It's becoming a more popular answer. It is. It's it between is. that and Angelina Jolie. Angelina and Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> For whatever reason, Micah, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt is the most popular answer. But they have so many kids, you wouldn't get much love. That's right. That's wow. true. Now they have so many kids, right? Wow. <laughs> and, and you know the best part of those five questions? I purchased and downloaded Micah's book in the time it took those five questions. I love the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I love the internet. Yeah, I, I think our, our I listeners think and viewers I, are going to be uh, super excited about your book. I, I can't wait to read it. Uh, I apologize for not reading it before this interview. Now that we've had a chance to chat, I want to read it even more. Hey, and you, I hope hey, our listeners do as well. You got an iPhone cable? I got to put this on my phone so I have something to listen to on the way home. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's how excited we are. Micah, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Awesome. Keep up the good work. I really appreciate it, and I, and I listen quite consistently. Thank you. Awesome. Micah, thanks, thanks so thanks, much. Micah. Take care. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back and talk about our stories for this week, so stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. No, I'm serious about that cable. Which All right, see you, you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks Micah. Micah. All right, bye-bye. Take care. Yeah, do those also? I, I want to read awesome. some. Gonna, yeah. Over Christmas break, dude, that's my no, book. No, seriously, I already downloaded it. It's uh, on Audible? <laughs> downloaded, yeah, Audible. Yeah. Um, and, I actually I do, do and I do actually need a book because I went to the car. I haven't traveled in a couple weeks, and I yep. went to the, to the car and realized the last time on the way home from a trip was I finished the audio book in the car like halfway home. Mm -hmm. And I got out to the car to come here, and I'm like, crap, I don't have an audio book to listen to. <laughs> that interview was very timely, though. Yeah. Very Which is, I mean, it's tragic that yep. these events happen. But uh, to have a guest like that who interviewed over 200 people, that was really cool. Yeah. That was really cool. I was thinking about that today. I'm like, I have to ask Micah about the, the recent events. So uh, it was good. It was a different interview. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. we, weren't, we weren't talking about type 11 code zeros, but <laughs> that's okay. No, but still lots oh, of parallels. Hey. Lots of parallels, yeah. Yep, and and I, I wanted to make sure that we brought that up in the beginning about the whole politics thing, because you know we're going to get the yeah. We, we usually don't. I we don't. don't. We, you know, the, in, we've been doing this ten years, and we've brought up politics so few times. And you know what, Larry? It's that's interesting. That's not what it's about. The amount of times that we've brought up politics over the past ten years, of all those times, 
and we could probably count them on two hands. We could probably count them on one hand. Yeah, we, we never got any negative feedback either. Yep. Yeah, because uh, even when we do talk about it, I think we're still. Yep, politics and religion. I think on two uh, in ten years. Yeah, but when we do, we yep. don't really. I don't know. We don't take sides one way or the other. No, so we don't. yeah, we don't. enough to a degree, I think, to really piss anybody off. Where we, we really take, take shit, as, I think, is on the the feminist issue. Uh -huh. We take more shit on that particular issue than anything else. Yep. But SJWs, baby. Uh, now you can, you can't sneeze now without yeah bringing out someone the, off. bringing out the uh, social I, justice warriors. We've been doing this a long time. Yeah, we have. not just the podcast, but giving presentation. We were giving presentations when we started the podcast, right? <laughs> Dude, I had to add <coughs> a disclaimer in the front of my presentations now. It's like, look, this has nothing to do with my day job. Like, don't bring that shit to me. If you got issues with my content, don't bring it to my day job. It doesn't reflect them. And two, if you're easily offended, you can leave. Like, seriously, if you stay here, I don't want to hear about how you were offended. Like, I have a way of presenting material. Mm -hmm. If that offends you, you can leave, go get a drink, <laughs> get, go yeah, mingle get, around wherever the event is <clears throat> and come back. I'm totally okay with that. Mm -hmm. Um, but don't come up to me with shit afterwards. I'm like, have you had people come up to you with shit afterwards? It happened recently because of all this political correctness. It was around the same time where Jerry Seinfeld came out with a statement and said <clears throat> he refuses to perform at colleges and universities. Around that same time is when I got shit, got feedback from personally, directly to me, and through Tenable. Really? And then yeah. ever since then, every time I speak publicly, I'm like, disclaimer. Yep. Don't do hey, it. Hey Nick, are we streaming? Yeah, even if we are, it's fine. I mean, I say that it's fine. Okay. Even if okay. we were, it's, yeah, no. I say that in front of, in front of my talks all the time. Now. Yeah, but no, I, so at Hackfest, um, I had my set of slides from DerbyCon. Yeah, for the password cracking stuff. Um, Dangerous, because what you present at DerbyCon, dude, doesn't present nowadays. And, nowadays and, does and, not and the go sad, over the well. The sad part, is the, so the, they had a deadlines for slide submissions because they were going to load them onto their laptop and mm -hmm. all those big thing. And it turns out I didn't even do that. I actually had to bring my laptop. But uh, they put the slides up and reviewed the slides the day before mm -hmm. the con. Like they had them weeks in advance. And they did it the day and before. And they reviewed them the day before. And Jennifer Santiago from Sands calls mm -hmm. me up and says, hey, Larry, I really like my job. I need to have you take some images out of your slides. Mm -hmm. Like Spider-Man masturbating. Um, <laughs> Spider-Man pooping um, has yeah, to go. A, a, any of the one, a, and I'm like, oh fuck. Oh, I should probably remove the ones where you're saying fuck and shit too. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, you had to remove them all. Yep. No chocolate rain. I was disappointed. It's it's bad, dude. It's bad. Ah, I thought of the question I wanted to ask right when he was gone. I Make will. Figures. What were you gonna say, Nick? Brain fuck. That's, that's bad. This is like a one-way conversation because I can't hear him. Oh, sorry, Joff. Yeah, sorry, Joff. Yeah, no, and, and Nick, you bring up a really good point. If you want to bring your kids to a conference, uh, I think we need to be mindful of that. And I think yeah. that... They're almost like a movie. There needs to be a rating for a talk. I, 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 and if you're asking us to come speak at the event, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, Paul, look, it's DerbyCon. It's and cool. Even if it's DerbyCon, if Dave came to me and said, hey, dude, look, like there's going to be kids in the audience. Yeah. Be like, that's cool. Yep. Hey, My talk is going to totally be PG if you tell me there's going to be kids in the audience. Because yep. like, hey, I don't you, want to expose well, kids to that. And, and, most and that's fine. And at most conferences, you can figure that out. Like, you can just look. Right. But yep. most conferences we look. present at, they're all adults in the room. Exactly. Exactly. And <coughs> all adults have gone to see an R-rated movie <coughs> in their lives. Yep. 99% of them, right? <laughs> that reminds me. I've got to go speak to Isaka, and I'm giving that same presentation. That I spoke. <laughs> Isaka. Isaka is... Was it Isaka, Nick? It was Isaka, right? It was ISSA. ISSA. I spoke at ISSA, and Steve Massarelli 
asked me to speak yep. and didn't give me any guidance. But I knew the people that would be in the audience yeah. anyway. And I, I, it, that's the first time I did it. I'm like, look, here's the disclaimer. I don't represent Tenable. And two, if you're easily offended, you know where the door is. Everyone stayed. I didn't get any negative feedback. <coughs> and I don't think Steve did either. And in fact, the feedback I got was interesting. 